So hello, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us for this week's webinar. Today's lecture is by Dr. Paul Wright, who's an honorary research fellow at the National Museum of Wales. He's also the director of PW Carbonate Geoscience. He's really well known for all of his work in carbonates. And Paul has helped develop uh, more recently a website resource called Carbonate World, along with Giovanna de la Porta. And it's been a really great resource for anybody interested in carbonates and um, diagenesis. So make sure and check that out. We will be posting the link for that in the messages. Paul was formerly a technical authority and principal sedimentologist consultant at BG Group. After being a professor in applied sedimentology at the School of Earth and Ocean Sciences at Cardiff University. Paul's research has focused on understanding the completeness of the stratigraphic record using taphonomy, forward modeling, and paleosols. So we're really excited to have him on this week. Paul, thank you so much for joining us. And um, today he's going to talk to us all about carbonate diagenesis. And with that, I will give you the mic. Thank you. Thank you for the uh, invitation to give this talk. Uh, it's a rather provocative title in, in some ways. And as many people watching know, I'm not a geochemist, so I'm going to be tackling this from a field-oriented point of view. Um, and by that title, I mean that the um, uh, effects of diagenetic processes um, uh, that many of which that we have only become to fully appreciate recently and not just for the laboratory side of, of the science, but for things that can be seen widely at outcrop or on seismic. And that's what I want to emphasize, features that we can see, diagenesis that we can readily see. Of course, some of it will be at the petrographic level, but these are field, or field scale or seismic scale diagenetic features. And the ability to understand and recognize these has increased very recently and that uh, uh, is providing us with many challenges and, and opportunities. Uh, this is a, a dolomite-free zone, or it's almost a dolomite-free zone, so I'm not be talking about dolomite in any detail. I know that will disappoint some, but, um, but uh, uh, it, dolomite is, is, doesn't appear until right near the end. So what's the aim of this talk? I want to review some aspects of how our understanding of the diagenetic effects we see in carbonate rocks has changed during my career. Okay, several decades, a long time, but I want to review some of the significant changes. And I want to highlight some of these key advances that remain relatively poorly covered in textbooks. There hasn't been a major carbonate textbook for several years now, and many of these uh, diagenetic processes, our understanding of them or our appreciation of them has increased very recently. Uh, the framework in which we interpret marine, meteoric, and barycarbonate diagenesis has been, and still is, undergoing a series of significant paradigm shifts. For example, we now appreciate, but have yet to fully understand, how critically important mineral transformations and translocations are in marine fluids, even during very shallow barrio, just meters of barrio. And there are too many unresolved issues about these, and that bothers me significantly. The key processes controlling diagenesis in shallow meteoric systems are also being revised, but I think we would purge ourselves of the older models that are pair on. And there's a rapidly growing appreciation of the extent of how hypergene fluids have the ability to create porosity in limestones without dolomitization. I'm talking right now not considering dolomitization where those processes are known to be very important, but this is the effect they're having on other diagenetic features. And these features are increasingly being recognized in the literature uh, on, on seismic data sets. So for many years, I used this diagram simplifying down the three diagenetic realms, the marine realm where the sediment is in contact with marine pore water, the meteoric realm where it's in contact with water ultimately derived from rainwater, and the subsurface realm, the burial realm, where we have a complex set of fluids, including deep basinal fluids. And I've highlighted some of the processes taking place with those where I've taught multiple courses over many years. But what about marine diagenesis? Let's start off with that one. I used to teach that the important processes we saw in the marine system were, of course, micritization, the ubiquitous alteration process you see. Cementation, whether it be in reefs or hard grounds or beach rock, whatever, the standard things I would teach. And of course, about dissolution in relation to the ACD and the CCD. But now we know that even marine pore fluids can cause stabilization of HMC 
to LNC and also aragonite loss and LNC precipitation. You may say, well, we've known about that for some time. Yes, but the implications of it, I don't think still have seeped their way through. Certainly in conversations with the young graduates that I have when I do training courses, this issue is not something which has been widely taught in many universities. So what I did as I put in that timeline of, of how these ideas about the, uh, the susceptibility of aragonite dissolution and transformation in shallow pore fluid waters, marine waters, has changed. Now, I'd love to go through all these events, all these, I think, benchmark moments, but I haven't got time. But I would just, although I will touch upon many of them, I just draw your attention to the fact that we can categorize them into three ways. The geochemical studies, the petrographic or petrological studies, and also the taphonomic studies. And there has been a, a, a change since the late 80s, right up to the present time, right up to this year, to papers that have appeared in the last few months, where we're beginning to understand further the importance of these processes. Now, aragonite is reactive. Um, there is evidence, and there has been for some years, particularly through the work of Lynn Walter and co-workers, and also earlier than that in siliciclastic sediments by R.C. Aller, that aragonite is susceptible to early dissolution in shallow buried pore fluid, very shallow pore fluid, because of, for example, under saturation, caused by the oxidation of hydrogen sulfide. The hydrogen sulfide itself produced from bacterial sulfate reduction. And that this oxidation effect is happening in the upper mixed layer oxygenated part of the sediment column. It seems to be particularly prevalent in fine grain sediments because in those sediments, low energy sediments, organic matter is able to accumulate and that is driving these microbial reactions. So the basic model is that uh, in the anoxic zone, where all the oxygen has been used up by oxidative bacteria, we go into an oxygen depleted zone. Sulfate reduction takes place. It produces hydrogen sulfide. It also produces a lot of carbon dioxide, of course. In particular, it seems the hydrogen sulfide as it diffuses into the upper part of the sediment column. I mean, we're talking centimeters or tens of centimeters. These, these, this unit is in thickness, what we call the taphonomically active zone. As the H2S diffuses into this, it, it is oxidized to produce dilute sulfuric acid, which it appears is the main agent for removing uh, aragonite very early on. This is a very simplified view in which we're seeing a sort of stratigraphy of different zones. And other models are available, of course. But it may be more sensible to not invoke this as something in a strict layered sense, but in a more 3D, a more of a three-dimensional mosaic of redox changes, creating this um, dissolution and then local uh, reprecipitation of, of calcite. Now, aragonite constitutes up to 90% of shallow water, modern carbonate, low latitude sediments that we find on carbonate platforms. Was that always the case? Well, if we hop back to Stepkowski's three gate faunas, which most graduates, I think, geology graduates would be taught, if not in the first year, in the second year, they'd be introduced to this concept of the three great faunas through the Phanerozoic. Or many of you will have seen, because it's in many textbooks, uh, Bruce Wilkinson's classic 1979 Strat fauna mineralogy plot, which shows the variations through time of the different organisms producing carbonate sediments. If we look then back in the early to late Paleozoic, we see a dominance of what Sapkowski calls the Paleozoic fauna, which is dominated by articulate brachiopods, by crinoids, by bryozoans by then the rugos and tablet corals, all of which were calcitic. But of course, when we go into the more modern faunas, which really take off through the Mesozoic, they are dominated by predominantly aragonitic forms, the corals, but especially the bivalves, the, the gastropods uh, um, as well. Now, based on our understanding of that, in Tekel and Wright produced a diagram from which this has been modified, which points out that if you look at modern carbonates, and that would extend right the way back probably to almost the late Paleozoic, certainly through the, most of the Cenozoic and into the Mesozoic, modern carbonate sediments would plot down here. You know, a handful of modern carbonate sediments would plot a mixture of predominantly aragonite and hymite calcite. And a typical diagenetic pathway is that uh, in almost any fluid, any diagenetic fluid, is the magne high magnesium calcite inverse the low magnesium calcite, and then we see a shift as aragonite is progressively dissolved and replaced or passively or actively replaced by calcite. But 
based on the fact that Paleozoic faunas and therefore carbonates were different, a different diagenetic pathway can be proposed where you have predominantly high mycalcite and, and low mycalcite, very little aragonite, and we see a different diagenetic pathway. That's wrong, we now know, because molluscan ar aragonite has been an important component of offshore marine sediments since the early Paleozoic. Now, how can I make such a statement that that the classic view, the Sepkowski view, the, the, the Wilkins view, and the view in, in many textbooks was wrong? And the evidence is that we discovered that former aragonitic mollusks and other aragonite groups, in fact, were present. And we do see their preservation in low energy deposits in the form of what are called skeletal lagerstatten. I'm not talking about soft bodied lagerstatten now, like the Berger shale but skeletal, shelly lagerstatten. And what we've discovered that they are preserved in relatively rare taphonomic windows. For example, we see entombment. That's where the former aragonitic component was preserved, seems to have been rapidly buried, perhaps beneath the taphonomically active zone where sulfide oxidation causes acidity. Uh, preserved, for example, beneath volcanic ashes or natural oil seeps. There are numerous examples out there in the geological record. These actually preserve life assemblages in situ, but also the uh, many descriptions of, of alloxanous deposits, such as debris flows, and often many storm beds, which rap would cause rapid burial to preserve a former aragonitic component. Sometimes they, they're preserved as aragonite still, other times they've been replaced during later diagenesis. Sometimes in hard grounds, we find frozen in aragonite dominated faunas that we didn't know were there. With that outside of the hard grounds. Anoxia is also important. Aragonitic shells deposited on, on an anoxic sea floor and now actually below the sulfide oxidation zone, which is higher in the water column, and so do not get dissolved. We also know, moving away from the marine system, that in fresh to brackish waters, which are very low in sulfate, particularly fresh waters, we do see enhanced preservation of former aragonitic fossils perhaps reflecting the fact, the fact there was less hydrogen sulfide activity. There are also pyrite, glauconite, and phosphate taphonomic windows, which are still uh, relatively poorly understood. So there are these taphonomic windows, which give us an insight into the fact that aragonite was much more common in marine sediments in deep time, not just in the Mesozoic and the Cenozoic, as the great faunas would suggest, but going right the way back into the, even into the Cambro War Division. Just some examples. Uh, here we've got um, uh, the Silurian examples from Sweden, and these allow us then, when we get got these Lagerstatten, to actually begin to quantify what's missing at the species level, and in some cases even at the individual or the population structure level. Uh, what we find is beneath volcanic ashes in the um, Silurian of Gotland, in the island in the Baltic, we find skeletal Lagerstatten in which we have preserved life assemblages. And these are dominated by aragonitic forms they've got here. Aragonite, bimineralic calcium, calcite and aragonite shells and pure calcite shells. These would plot here. However, if you look at what we would regard as the normal fauna, I mean, we're talking about 99.9% .9 of the time. If you look at a mid-ramp, Silurian, tropical, subtropical fauna, you will see this dominated by brachiopods, bryozoans, corals, trilobites, echinoderms. But this is the remnant death assemblage. And they would plot down here. In fact, uh, as this paper that um, I was involved in with Leslie Churns point out, points out, for this Silurian example, the entire molluscan fauna may generally be underrepresented by at least a hundredfold. Okay? Not a few percent, a hundredfold. And this is called the missing mollusks effect. Another example, jumping to the Jurassic, which was supposed to be a time of where mollusks were dominant, but in fact, they appear to be much more dominant than we thought. If we go to one of the skeletal Lagerstatten, this is from one in South Wales, buried uh, in uh, the fauna buried in life position, we see again a dominance of aragonitic fossils, mainly bivalves and gastropods. But if we go to the same stratigraphic level at outcrop, where it wasn't preserved by a catastrophic event, we find it's dominated by the classic fossils that you get in the, in the low Jurassic, the blue lias of Britain, 
um, we get mainly a calcitic fauna. Here, 84% of the assemblage was made of aragonitic mollusks, which are missing from most localities. Bear in mind that this fauna is actually very well known because it's been intensively collected professionally for over 200 years. And I'll come on to the whole issue of the blue lias and collections and Hollywood films later on. So we've got our Silurian example, we've got our Jurassic example, there's a Devonian example here from South, uh, Southeast Australia. There are many, many of these skeletal larger stuff now known where we can make direct comparisons between what we've lost and what we thought we had. Okay, the dominant thing is that in these examples, what is being lost are aragonitic fossils, mainly shallow burrowers and epifaunal gastropods, including the micro mollusk biota. The bulk of diversity in marine faunas in, at the skeletal level is in the micro molluscan community. And we're also losing that as well. Although that in some of these large starting, these amazing micro mollusks are actually preserved. If you want to see the statistics behind these and other studies, I referred you to this paper in Peleos that was published some years ago. The actual figures of before and after, if you like, are in there. Is there any other evidence in the rock record about all this replacement? or this disappearance of aragonite? And also where does all that carbonate, this catastrophic amount of aragonite that we're losing go? Now many mid outer ramp successions, slope and even basinal carbonates exhibit limestone marl alternations, LMAs, or as other people like to call them diagenetic bedding, carbonate diagenetic bedding. Now these are normally associated with uh, mudrock successions because they stand out very clearly. This is a succession from South Wales, from the, the lower Jurassic Blue Lias Cliffs on the South Wales coast. All of that bedding, all of that bedding is diagenetic. Surely you'd say there's some storm bedding in there. No, it's all diagenetic bedding. That's carbonate that developed within predominantly a mudrock system, a silicyclastic mudrock system, because you're simply reorganizing the calcium carbonate, taking it out of aragonite, and then reprecipitating it quite early on as calcite. The carbonate grew with cement, interstitial cement here with clay cages around it. Uh, these microsporitic and macritic limestones contain geochemical evidence suggesting that they were derived from very shallow marine fluids. They also contain trapped relic aragonite crystals. This model of LMAs, of diagenetic bedding, has largely been developed by Axel Munich of Erlangen and his co-workers. Uh, and they show us examples throughout the stratigraphic record. And there are talks on the SEDS online webinar library, both by Theresa Knoll and by Axel Munica, discussing in detail LMA. So I draw your attention to those talks to, to complement what I'm saying here. However, there are some significant uncertainties um, and disagreements. And some of you, if you attended the 2019 Bathurst meeting, would be aware that Axel and I actually gave a joint talk together on the stage at the same time, in which we discussed the importance of these processes and also the uncertainties and offered different views. One of the uncertainties is what are the driving mechanisms for aragonite dissolution? Um, I've blamed it on, on, on hydrogen sulfide oxidation, but there are other chemical processes that can trigger both the aragonite dissolution and calcite precipitation. Where does this release calcium carbonate go? Does it move up, diffuse upwards? Does it diffuse down, downwards? Or should we be think, simply thinking of it in a sort of 3D mosaic of losses and gains? What about the provenance of the aragonite? Has it come from aragonite mud, actual original mud in the sediment, or a missing mollusk, the component which has supplied this material, or both? If missing mollusks are the main source, then much of the mud grade carbonate we see in LMAs was never originally carbonate mud in the first place. And also um, remember that LMAs occur both in intervals which represent calcite and aragonite seas. What bothers me in particular is how much of this carbonate is back flexed to seawater and how much is fixed. And is this an important budget for uh, issue for thinking about carbonate budgets? Right, and I hope I'm going to cite this and quote this correctly. This is, a, to me, a very important point, which has relatively recently been made by Higgins and co-workers. Now, they were looking at variability in, in bulk sediment in the delta uh, calcium-44 isotope values. And they concluded the, the variability in bulk sediment delta uh, 
calcium 44 implies globally significant mass fluxes between calcium of calcium between seawater and shallow marine port layers within the upper tens of meters of the sediment column, at least in the sites that they were uh, examining. And I think this is supported by all sorts of other evidence that there's a lot of flux between the shallow buried sediment and seawater as a result of the, the loss of aragonite. Wheelie et al, for example, concluded that as little as 25% of the aragonite released from bivalve aragonite dissolution could account for the formation of diagenetic bedding, LMA, in the old division of Sweden. Now, that estimate did not consider aragonite loss from micromollusks, which is, as I've said, is a very important component, juveniles, and planktic input, including spatfall. If you add those to the models, you may end up suggesting that uh, as little as 5% may be trapped in LMAs, and therefore 90% of the um, uh, carbonate released from aragonite dissolution actually ends back up in the water column. Um, now, the depth at which this calcite precipitation takes place is such, we know, that these carbonate cemented horizons, the, the LMA units, the nodular carbonates, are rarely exhumed. Now, some do get exhumed to produce hard grounds, but that's not the origin of all hard grounds. So we know that this stuff is forming sufficiently deep that it's not being exhumed very often. But that was not the case in the earliest Paleozoic when the depth at which uh, diagenetic uh, carbonates formed was much shallower, increasing the likelihood of actually seeing reworking of that carbonate by storms. And this has had a, big import, a very important effect on, for example, the types of sediment we see in the lower Paleozoic, and even to some extent, it's influenced the um, biodiversity events which took place in the Ordovician because it provided a, a new type of substrate. This depth at which diagenetic carbonate formed below the seafloor increased, deepened, if you like, through the Canberra Ordovician, mirroring the increased depth of bioturbation, what we might call the active zone or the PAZ, taphonomically active zone. And this suggests that the cemented zone might be forming below that zone, possibly in the sulfate reduction zone. And as a consequence of the deepening, we get reduced effects of reworking. Now, quoting the, the studies done by Drissa and Botcher, and there have been more recent studies done um, by Lydia um, Tahan and others, um, what we can say is that during the early to mid Cambrian, subtidal burrowing depth was less than three centimeters, and typically on a millimeter scale. Until the mid Ordovician, the depth of burrowing remained around less than six centimeters. But by the late Ordovician, that depth had increased. It was still less than 30 centimeters, but it was deeper. And also the intensity of burrowing had increased. Why is he telling you this? Well, if you look in storm influenced ramp settings, the depth at which the cemented zone below the taphonomically active zone, the depth at which it occurred seems to have been lowering. Now, this seems to have been. Uh, interacting, if you like, with, with storm processes and the probability of that carbonate layer being eroded decreased. Therefore, the sediment cemented zones, the LMA zones, the LMA beds, if you like, thin beds, were longer within the, the sulfate reduction zone and, for a lot, and that longer period allowed them to become thicker. And therefore, we can see these effects in the stratigraphic record. For example, if you look when burrowing depth was particularly shallow and the TAS was thin, and therefore these cemented zones are forming very near the surface, we get evidence of frequent reworking of that material because this is the time when flat pebble breccias were very common. I'm not talking about flat pebble breccias associated with peritidal carbonates, now flake breccias. I'm talking about this distinctive facies type, which is very common in mid to outer ramp systems in the earliest Paleozoic. And we see a spike in abundance, at least as judged by publications, in the, um, in the nature and the occurrence of flat pebble conglomerates, flat pebble breaches. The next thing we see as we go into the early to mid Ordovician is the rise of hiatus nodules, which are effectively fat, flat pebbles. Uh, and then uh, later on in the Ordovician, we see the, the spike in the whole of the Phanerozoic, really, of hard ground occurrence. 
And this would coincide with the fact that the cemented zone is now sufficiently thick that even if it gets exhumed, it's not getting broken up by storms and waves. And then by the end of the Ordovician, we're seeing the development of a much thicker tars and probably therefore uh, less likelihood of the cemented zone to be exhumed, so it has more time to grow. And we see the development of much thicker layers in the LMA system. And we see a rapid decline then in the, um, the number of hard grounds we see because they're simply not getting excavated. So we do see again, because I like to see physical evidence of diagenesis, we're seeing evidence of how diagenesis, the effects of this diagenesis of aragonite has changed through time. Now, there is fussy specificity of this as well. If we look at where we see LMAs, it tends to be in fine grained, low energy environments, presumably because that's where the organic matter is able to accumulate, to uh, have microbial process act upon it, produce H2S, and then the H2S gets oxidized, whatever. So we don't see these effects in shallow water situations. This is vividly seen in, in outcrops in South Wales and the Jurassic, where I, I, I was with a class just on Sunday and we were demonstrating this. If you go from shore face deposits developed on a Paleozoic land surface, we see lots of aragonitic shell material and nicely preserved bivalves in some cases in these rainstorms. But these have all undergone later replacement of aragonite. They've survived the task, they've been preserved, and they've altered later during burial diagenesis. If you go to the offshore fossils, at the same age to what the famous blue lias outcrops. I've shown you one of them already. Um, there's no aragonitic fossils in there. It's only calcitic fossils. So this specificity of the removal of aragonite is very environmentally controlled. I make that point because in a number of paleontological studies that have been done in the last 20 years, that simple fact, even though it was clearly stated repeatedly in the first part of this, first decade of this century, um, seems to have missed many paleontologists by, who um, seem to think that if you find aragonitic fossils in shallow water, wave-dominated, high-energy carbonates, that means Mr. Mollusks, as an effect, doesn't operate. It does operate, and is associated with LMAs in offshore settings. But we see these, the evidence so clearly of LMAs in siliciclastic units, because we see this contrast between the limestone layer and, we, uh, uh, and the mudrock host, the siliciclastic mudrock. And if you go to parts of the lower carboniferous limestone in South Wales, you will see shaley intervals, which show beautiful diagenetic nodules and some diagenetic bedding. At the same outcrop, if you walk a short distance, so you are uh, higher in the stratigraphy, but in a slightly different depositional setting, you'll see, again, fine-grained limestones, but really no evidence of diagenetic bedding or even diagenetic nodule development. Does that mean that all this issue of aragonite loss and calcite precipitation doesn't apply? Well, I think it does apply. I think we've perhaps not been looking very carefully for the evidence. What about chalk? Chalk, the Cretaceous Danian chalks of, of, um, of the Northern Hemisphere, were originally very rich in aragonitic fossils. They aren't now in most cases if you look at chalk, but we know they were originally rich in aragonitic fossils because we see them preserved in certain hard ground faunas and in other types of skeletal lager stuff, and particularly certain large debris flows, for example, are full of originally aragonitic fossils. So we knew, know they were there. Also, chalk was deposited slowly, so there was a long residence time for diagenetic phases to develop. So we would expect to see in the chalk a lot of evidence of diagenetic bedding. In fact, we don't. We do see uh, uh, evidence of um, some diagenetic bedding, especially when it, it gets exhumed to produce nice, very clear hard grounds. And also we see evidence of diagenetic nodules and sometimes they're reworked. However, something has happened quite recently, which makes us think that there's a lot more evidence for this diagenetic cement, early diagenetic cement in chalk. And that is the work by uh, Tagliavento and co-workers who, uh, looking at some of the Danish chalk, have interpreted micards. Now, micards is a term that's in the literature for carbonate particles, which are less than five microns in size. And their studies, the, 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 what they suggest is that they can see extensive development of micards having taken place relatively early in the history of the chalk. And they propose that it's also due to the loss of aragonite 
in these marine pore waters. And the really telling observation they make is that they think that there's an equal contribution in the chalk, in the bulk chalk, from micarbs, that diagenetic calcite cements, and coccoliths. And as you know, there are a lot of coccoliths in chalk. So this is one of the first times that we're getting a hint of how important these processes may be, not just in shaley sequences, silicastic sequences, but in pure carbonate sequences as well. I would draw your attention to the fact that um, the microcrystals, which are the strange, often very beautiful microcrystals that are associated with many microporous carbonate reservoirs, could also have a similar origin. Uh, in, in a recent very thorough review of the, the, the microporosity paradox or dilemma, if you like, Hashim and Kazmerak in 2019 pointed out that geochemical data suggests that most of the microcrystals which are associated with um, uh, microporous limestones, in fact, seem to have a marine fluid origin. So maybe it's another example of whereby this loss of aragonite and reprecipitation of calcite taking place relatively early in the diagenetic history is having an impact. So that's the marine system. What I want to do now is to uh, look at um, the meteoric system, and in particular to look at two aspects. One is the phreatic zone diagenesis. We used to think, or some, there was an idea that this was generally mineral driven, particularly by aragonite, whereas there also is the view that it's CO2 driven. And there have been some newer contributions in the last few years on this to what has been a long running debate. And also to look at coastal zone diagenesis, in particular the issue of mixing corrosion versus again, CO2 driven diagenesis, something that may lead to the demise of the classic a Caribbean diagenetic model, a paradox shift. Now, um, this is a sort of diagram that has appeared in textbooks now for two generations almost, uh, showing what we'd expect under a, an isolated carbonate platform or a small island. We'd have a Vado zone, we'd have a freshwater phreatic zone, a mixing zone, and we'd have a phreatic, marine phreatic or saline phreatic underneath. And you get different types of diagenesis in this. Different types of cements can form, different ge geometries of cements can form, fabrics. Now, the earlier view was that the processes of dissolution being caused within the freshwater phreatic zone were re result of CO2 being introduced from the atmosphere and from the soil directly as CO2. And that the undersaturation caused by that cause aragonite to dissolve and low magnesium calcite to precipitate and high magnesium calcite to stabilize. The result then, was it was argued, was you'd get widespread cementation in the phreatic zone. The availability of aragonite was the critical factor, and this was referred to as the mineral-driven transformation model. So it would happen widely in the phreatic zone, the, the freshwater phreatic zone. An alternative model, which was produced as roughly at that time, um, is now being supported by much more recent research, showing again, microbial oxidation of organic matter directly entering um, the, uh, the aquifer. In other words, it's dissolution generated in the aquifer, not above the aquifer. So this effect is concentrated in the upper part of the phreatic zone, top of the aquifer, and the lower part of the vado zone. Hence, dissolution is concentrated there, and also, if we're losing aragonite and, and then with the possibility of precipitating calcite in, in next to it, because the solubility contrast is so great, then that's where we'd start to get aragonite cement, sorry, calcite cementation. It would also be localized. This is a, a recent contribution by Cooper et al. looking at microbial activity driven CO2 activity in relation to how vegetation is supplying that organic matter. Um, I like this model. It's called the organic transport model by some workers. I like it because it explains why cementation zones in many carbonate rocks associated with subaerial diagenesis are often just a few meters thick. And this goes back to a statement by McLean et al. as far back as 1992, that this uh, cementation and aragonite dissolution are not taking place throughout the majority of the freshwater phreatic zone but uh, are related to, the, but are not therefore related to this, the relative solubility of the different minerals, but are driven by CO2 activity. Now, that is not to say that other things aren't going on in these phreatic aquifers, of course, that, and certainly in the base of the aquifer, we may see evidence that 
uh, hydrogen sulfide is being released from stagnant saline groundwaters, and that can be driving some sort of dissolution as well. But I like it, this idea of the, the, the um, organic transport model because I can go to an outcrop. Now, this is a typical outcrop of carboniferous limestone in Britain. It is gray, it is boring. It can be very difficult to motivate students to take an interest in it. But this is an exquisite peritidal sequence full of the most beautiful microbial laminites with little storm layers. There's a paleosol in here. There's a vado zone in here with vado cements and calcrete textures and rhizolites. And we have a zone with phreatic cements. It's only a meter thick. And beneath it, we have the rest of this oolitic sand body in here doesn't have any pre-compaction cements. The grains are largely welded together. So this early phreatic cemented zone was very thin. Now, other workers on carboniferous oolite shoals have documented the same thing. Madeline Raven did it, and especially the work of Alison Sir. And I draw your attention to this, this lovely paper looking at quantitative pet petrographic features in a, a carbonate sand body. And in this case, Alison was able to point out just how thin some of these free, early phreatic cemented zones were fitting in with that model. So I like the organic transport model. But we have another model for looking at diagenesis in the coastal diagenetic zone. And this is based on the idea of um, burial corrosion, where we have uh, extensive circulation taking place in the coastal, immediate coastal zone, as you have a discharge of fresh water and mixing with the seawater zone. This leads to extensive mixing corrosion. And also at the coast, the, um, the water table basically also comes down to the coast. And therefore, you can get uh, mixing corrosion related to that surface as well, enhancing dissolution to create caves, to create platform margin cave systems or flank margin caves, as they're also called. Now, I'm not a geochemist. Uh, mixing corrosion, I'm certain many of you are better aware of it than I am. I like to explain to people by saying that if you take two solutions, which are both super saturated with respect to calcium carbonate, because the saturation curve for calcite is non-linear, when you mix those two fluids, you can produce a new fluid, which is no longer super saturated with respect to calcium carbonate, and dissolution can take place, so it does reach that point. I know that's a sort of cheap way to try and explain mixing corrosion. But mixing corrosion, which can take place with any suitable fluids, is most typically seen at the mixing zone between seawater and freshwater. It produces cave systems here from the Caribbean. These uh, due to cliff line recession, you can see earlier Pleistocene caves developed by what were thought to be mixing zone processes. And they can also produce what's called Swiss cheese porosity as well, although that may have an origin related to redox changes around the uh, base of the freshwater aquifer. Now, so we had our mixing zone model, which was doing well for decades. Um, and uh, now, if we come back to the idea of how important PCO2 is linked to the oxidation of organic matter, uh, recently, Jason Gelly and co-workers have proposed that, in fact, what we've been interpreting as mixing zone dissolution is, in fact, driven at the water table now, not at the base of the phreatic zone, meteoric phreatic zone, but at the water table, and we've mistaken where this dissolution has taken place as a result of the processes I've just talked about with the organic transport model. So this is a, quite a big paradigm shift. This is one I have a slight problem with. I'm not disputing the mechanisms at all. I'm just suggesting that much of the information coming from these has come from the wetter end of carbonate systems today. And in fact, some of them have come from areas which are actually covered in what, what can only describe as jungle. Um, and I'm wondering what would happen in the different climates and different organic input, whether the mixing zone model actually needs to be completely thrown out or maybe there's still room for it. This is an example from the Danian shelf carbonates from shelf margin carbonates from North Spain, where um, Basita et al, and it, it was Juan Ignacio Basita who did this work, he actually mapped out the shape, the geometry of the mixing zone or alleged or interpreted mixing zone caves. So we know that shape of what appears to be the lens or the zone in which that mix, that corrosion took place. And I think this is a characteristic of a mixing zone dissolution effect, not a meteoric phreatic, the, the, the top of the meteoric phreatic zone. So I'm just suggesting we don't throw the mixing zone model out quite yet until we perhaps investigate it where it might be more important in perhaps another climatic regime. But we do identify 
mixing zones. Here's one interesting example that Van Tuhl et al. identified from um, uh, examples in uh, from seismic from the Browse Basin. There are also classic examples from the Permian Basin that have been described for decades now. The work of Craig and Pinker, and more recently, Do et al., which were looking at the distribution within the, the Permian San, San Andres formation and the Yates field and so forth, famous examples of Paleocarpic reservoirs. And also from the Precaspian, the Carboniferous reservoirs four kilometers beneath the Kazakh steppe, where a range of probable mixing zone systems have been identified. Of course, whatever mechanisms you invoke for these slight margin car systems, they're actually very rarely documented in the rock record, which is another issue. And finally, the subsurface realm to finish off on. Uh, I want to look at burial corrosion. Um, we were always taught, or the old textbooks tell you, or I was certainly taught that. Deep burial diagenesis is the zone of compaction, pressure solution, and cementation. Well, it isn't always. We now know that significant secondary blocks of porosity formation can take place. Uh, a depth, a kilometer's depth, that will produce holes in which um, uh, drill bits can be lost in, and that this is dissolution which is clearly taking place at depth and being preserved at depth. And much of it is re related to hypergene fluids, which are fluids which are moving up. Now, this has been known for some time, and yet it seems that the, much of the carbonate community has taken quite a long time to wake up to this. And you still meet people who have no idea that this takes place. In fact, you even have papers claiming it doesn't exist. Now, these effects have often been referred to as late stage dissolution or deep dissolution or burial dissolution or mesogenetic dissolution. Now, for the purposes of balance, a paper was written a few years ago by Steve Ehrenberg and co-workers which disputed this whole idea. Like the emperor's new clothes, the model of mesogenetic carbonate porosity creation is supported by personal opinion and reference to the many who have believed it before. They argue that the theory of dissolution by acid pore waters does not produce significant net increases. They claim that it's not supported by quantitative data or any information on, on fluid flow. And they state, as no rational mechanism can explain the formation of mesogenetic secondary porosity, the occurrence of such porosity cannot be predicted or modeled. Incidentally, they focused on compactional flow in sedimentary basins. But without getting into that debate, because responses to it have been published before, I just want to draw your attention to this lovely quote by Toth et al. in a paper published in 1999. A lack of understanding or even awareness of regional groundwater hydraulics by specialists of the various subdisciplines prevents them from recognizing the cause and effect relation between basinal groundwater flow and the particular phenomena that they may be studying. And we know that flow like this is typically focused at fractured carbonate platform margins, where you see a lot of this effect, and also along transtensional fault systems. We're not short of mechanisms, geochemical mechanisms to produce this dissolution. And we're certainly not sort of evidence of its effect as well. So we're dealing with hypergenic fluids. These are fluids caused by ascending, sorry, these are fluids which are ascending fluids. They're coming from beneath the surface or the formation that they're affecting. Okay. We know about this. We know, for example, that fluids like this are caused with extensive dolomitization and mineralization. It just seems to be a reluctance by some carbonate specialists to appreciate that it's also causing a lot of dissolution at depth as well. Now, it's not just the occasional pore which is dissolved out. Here we've got rexia chimneys produced by this effect, 350 meters high from the Eocene of offshore India. Seismic scale collapse features. Now, some of these are along faults. Some of these are inherited from negative flower structures. But the bulk of this is also collapse as well in rexia chimneys. And these are from Western Canada, from the Devonian. Here from the Cretaceous of Kuwait, only very recently published. And these are extensive chaotic breccia zones from the South China Sea developed in Miocene carbonates. It isn't just that we see the dissolution along the breccia pipes. Here from India, this breccia pipe has a diameter of one kilometer. Okay. Now, when we go away from the main feeder systems, because these fluids were fault fed, we can go and find kilometers away stylolites, which have been etched. You can put your hand in a stylolite. These are super permeability zones, you know, in a reservoir. The whole matrix has been pervasively dissolved as well. So that in some instances, 
all the grains are gone and you're left with shards of the original cement. I don't know what you call a rock which is made of porosity and remnant cement. I don't know how you classify that, but that's how intense this alteration zone can be kilometers from the main feeder fault. There are lots of mechanisms that create this dissolution. And I pro uh, provided supplementary information, which will be on the SEDS online website, that goes through each of these major processes, what the chemistry is in a simplified way, because that's the way you have to understand it, and um, what the effects are. And also the criteria for identifying them as well at the petrographic level, lots of pictures of how burial diagenesis affects different types of later stage diagenetic features. So it's best to call this hypergene dissolution. And Mitch Harris tried to, to redefine burial corrosion in a paper which was published search of the discovery article a few years ago. Now, even with our best efforts, no definition is perfect. And I draw your attention to it. You can probably pick holes in this definition as well. But you see, this is not new. Is it this idea of deep regional flow and hypergenic fluids is not new. Cast workers have been documenting it for many years. I refer you to the, the papers by Alex Klimchuk or by Art Palmer, which discuss hypergene dissolution, macroporosity uh, in, in some detail. It's an old idea. And of course, although I said this, it's a dolomite free zone, it's not actually going to be a dolomite free zone because dolomite researchers have been looking at this as well. Thermal flux model in Western Canada, the HTD play in the classic slave point systems in the Hotchkiss embayment in, in, in the Western Canadian sedimentary basin or also being applied more recently, papers published very recently on the same thing effect in the Cambrian sequences in Canada, and also in the Permian Basin thermal convection. So deep regional circulation creating dolomitization and cast, but it also creates a lot of dissolution, burial corrosion, if you want to call it that. So basically we could define, you know, define that we have dolomitation, dolomitation heavy systems Geothermal dolomites, classic HTD dolomites, and the thermobaric dolomites of Western Canada. And, and then we have dolomitization light diagenetic systems, which would be the ones where only dissolution seems to be the dominant signal. And of course, we actually see increasing importance of these, even as we go from this sort of field of, 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 of the dolomitization into the dolomite free types of dissolution. Perhaps these are influenced by magnesium rich hypergenic fluids and seawater, and these are magnesium poor systems. But we're only extending an idea that we already have. It just seems to be a reluctance to make that slight jump in some quarters. So there's the summary. Um, basically, uh, I hope you get the point that we've seen paradigm shifts. We should be careful about throwing out old ideas and that burial corrosion is a real process. Our appreciation of carbonate diagenesis is now more diverse than it was. It's more visible maybe than it was. But we all need to be aware that that diversity, okay, is something which is important. And we should always be assessing the current paradigms or models instead of what we've all been guilty of doing. And that is fitting the things we think we see to existing models. We have to be more circumspect about our data, perhaps more objective about our data as well. So I've tried to summarize, summarize these in three little diagrams right at the end, and you can obviously access all this. But now I want to show you that diagenetic bedding is now really ingrained in popular culture. Uh, the recent film Ammonite actually has Mary Anning, the legendary Mary Anning, as played by Kate Winslet, with Charlotte Murchison, the wife of the legendary stratigrapher Murchison, as in Permian, et cetera, et cetera. Um, they're getting very excited here because they're collecting a diagenetic nodule from the blue lias, the lower Jurassic um, of the Dorset coast. Um, more movie fun. This is a film which was supposed to come out on Amazon Prime on September the 7th, but in fact is now, I understand, coming out on November the uh, 26th, where another film about Mary Anning, hopefully this one will talk more about her scientific achievements than the other one, and this is diagenetic bedding. So diagenetic bedding is now cool, okay? Um, but let's not forget it always was cool. Here is Meryl Streep in a scene from the 1981 film, The French Lieutenant's Woman. She'd been helping Jeremy Irons, who was the character Charles Simpson, in the film Collect Fossils of Lyme Regis. This is diagenetic bedding running through these outcrops. And for especially for the Brits 
don't forget that in the very tearful scenes in, in the 2006 episode of Doctor Who, where David Tennant then played, sorry, Doctor Who then played by David Tennant, said goodbye to Rose Tyler, played by Billy Piper. Those of you who were very keenly watching it would have realized that the backdrop uh, to Rosie Tyler was diagenetic bedding in the Blue Lias, the Lower Jurassic of South Wales. So this has really entered into popular culture. And I have to give a plug, there's a meeting at the Jolsock in Linden next May on carbonate diagenesis, but looking at how carbonate diagenesis influences carbonate production and development. And with that, I will hand back to Chelsea. Paul, thank you so much for that wonderful presentation. I surely enjoyed it. I hope everybody in the audience did as well. Um, if you didn't see the chat, you can now type in your questions for Paul um, directly in there and I'll read them out. Please send them to everybody and not just to SEDS Online. Um, and also let us know where you're watching from. And Paul, I don't know if you want to share your screen again, just to pop it up in case somebody has um, questions on a specific uh, okay. topic from your slides or anything like that. While we're waiting for questions, um, I had a couple for you, so I can I can sneak some of mine in there before anybody else uh, gets going. So kind of, um, oh, uh, Rodrigo, I see that you have your hand up. Um, please actually just type your question into the chat and we can get to it. Um, okay, so in the meantime, I have a little bit maybe of a loaded question for you. Um, but I'm just curious, of course, uh, you talked about all of the changes that we've seen in carbonate diagenesis research. And what do you think has been sort of the biggest driver to some of those changes? I was just trying to think of myself, you know, is, is it the development of new proxies? Is it sort of this kind of newer understanding of the role of biology and um, biochemistry or uh, just purely more research and more examples out there? Do you have a an idea or a feeling for what you you think is the biggest driver? I think that you know we've appreciated that the, the chemistry, the science, the, the chemistry has to underline the science of doing all this. You know, and our awareness of the complexity of of microbial processes in in, in creating the loss of aragonite and other and fixing calcium carbonate in other ways, I think is absolutely crucial. So. A lot of what we do, you know, we're, we're ultimately, you could argue, handmaidens of, of geochemistry. But that isn't to say that basic field observations, looking at the nature of LMAs and SEM work, and petrography has also been driving a lot of this. The awareness of how skewed the fossil record is has been driven this because it, it's shown how much aragonite has to be being reflexed. New, the application of newer techniques, such as new approaches, such as using uh, calcium isotopes, and of course, the industry, the oil and gas industry, uh, unfashionable as it may be, has been the driver for a lot of this. The awareness of the importance of burial corrosion has really, I think, been largely driven by the discovery by most people working as, as carbonate sedimentologists in the oil industry of just how amazingly common these effects are. So I think it's, it's a multiple thing, but um, ultimately, we depended on the geochemists for giving us a framework for understanding what we see. But that doesn't mean to say we stop looking at outcrops, we stop questioning the, the, the older paradigms, and uh, you know it, these things have to go in parallel. Absolutely, I definitely agree. Um, so, anybody who has questions out there, I know I saw a few hands up in the um, participants list, so please type them in so everyone can, can have an idea of what your question is. Um, in the meantime, I had even more. <laughs> so, um, you know, moving forward in the realm of carbonate diagenesis, what do you think the biggest, um, where do you think really the biggest progress is to be made in that type of research? Is it, um, again, in sort of the biogeochemistry realm or petrophysics? Um, any, any thoughts there? Well, I, it's a worry to me that because so much of what we've done has been driven by the industry, or driven, I should say, by funding from the industry, mm. I'm worried that that is going to dry up. Um, it's, there are so many, th 
we scratch the surface. E every generation thinks they've solved most of the problems. And then we just peel off another page and we realize we've only just skimmed the surface. A new world appears. Um, and I think we're a very long way down the line of understanding carbonate diagenesis, diagenesis and the complexity of it, particularly a lot of early diagenesis. We now have this amazing ability to date diagenetic phases, mm -hmm. um, which I think is going to change everything. But I'm, I'm worried that the funding will begin to dry up for doing a lot of that work. The thing that most bothers me personally is if, and I've been beating the aragonite dissolution drum for 20 odd years, um, if it really is as important as I think, we should be able to find evidence of it affecting any muddy carbonate. But we don't. Mm -hmm. I mean, are we not looking hard enough? Um, we used to think that, oh, yes, we could explain a lot of early diagenetic micrite in uh, much of the, the record because it was recrystallized aragonite, going back to Lazami and Sandberg. But in fact, finding that evidence is very difficult. I mean, just how much of carbonate micrite is reconstituted aragonite, or is it just HMC and LMC mud? I think it's quite a fundamental problem because when I walk a section as I did a few weeks ago in the Gower in South Wales, where I walk from diagenetic bedding in a shale dominated unit, 50 meters into a carbonate dominated unit in the same succession. And of course, there was no evidence of any of these diagenetic processes at all that I could see it outcrop. Is it just all hidden there or not? And to me, trying to find out what the nature is of this aragonite loss in, in, in all low energy carbonates is, is an issue which is a, is a serious gap in our understanding. And therefore, how much, if we're talking about carbonate budgets, if we're looking at productivity rates in a modern carbonate system and extrapolating that back to deep time, when 95% of the aragonite which was produced in that carbonate environment is being back flexed anyway, I think it has huge implications for understanding and source to sink, if you like, if you want to use that modern yeah. phrase for understanding source to sink in carbonates. Definitely. So we all need to keep our eyes out then. <laughs> That's what I'm hearing. Um, okay, so we have a ton of questions for you now in the chat. It seems like they are mostly going directly to SEDS online. So everybody, please don't forget to send to everyone um, and we'll make sure and get your questions read out. Okay, our first question is coming from Jim uh, in Dublin. Hi, Jim. Hi, Paul. Statistically speaking, should there be some aragonite mollusks that were partially dissolved before they passed out of the, the dynamic TAZ? But it seems to be all or nothing. We're not um, sort of uh, caught in the yes. yeah. um, This is an interesting point because one of the differences between uh, Axel's view of LMA formation and mine is that Axel's material that he studies does contain some relic former aragonite grains. But in the LMAs I've looked at, and I've gone back and asked former research students to check um, the LMAs that we've worked on, with, I've worked on with them, show virtually no preservation of the former aragonite component. Mm -hmm. So this is why, in a way, Alex and I gave that talk two years ago, was to try and stimulate people to think about this. Um, sometimes aragonite gets through. For example, large, robust ammonite shells sometimes seem to get through the TAS, whereas small ammonites don't. Um, but my experience is very little aragonite seems to survive the TAS, but that is not other people's experience. Interesting. Yeah, I know in, um, I think it was Teresa's talk, Teresa Suds online talk, which is of course on the website and on the YouTube channel for anyone who wants to go back and look at the, that talk on LMAs. She showed a really nice image um, of the boundary of a calcitic and aragonitic layer where uh, a shell basically was directly at that boundary and it was essentially half eaten away. <laughs> so it showed um, yeah, quite nice evidence of that. Um, okay, our next question comes from Tracy Frank. Um, she wants to know how important is climate in determining diagenetic pathways, obviously more important in neuritic settings. 
Um, I don't know. Uh, I mean, obviously, climate does have an impact on different types of dolomitization. I, so my concern over the climate issue is particularly in relation to whether the, we throw out the mixing zone model and keep the CO2 model, because the, the many of the studies which have emphasized the CO2 model have come, for example, from Yucatan or from the wetter end of the Caribbean, where there is where there's just a, a marked vegetation cover, and therefore a lot of organic matter is entering in and getting into the top of the aquifer. Um, I don't know what would happen if you looked at perhaps, say, in the, the drier end of the Caribbean system, you went, looked at Turks and Caicos, for example, whether you'd see mixing zone corrosion as being more prevalent. Um, but other than, than that, I don't know. But of course, in, in terms of um, hypogenic fluids, it doesn't matter what the climate was doing, this stuff has come a long way um, uh, on its, and, and it's taken a long time to get there. But I certainly think in meteoric diagenesis, the climate may be something that needs evaluating in relation to the now the opposed models for what is causing most dissolution and release of aragonite in meteoric systems. That, that's all I can I can say about that. Yeah, I agree that I think it would um, create a large difference in the the organic constituents and the breakdown um, thereafter of those, and maybe play a, a large role. But yeah. Somebody, somebody can take a, a stab at that maybe in the next research um, topic. So, okay, our next question comes from Kate Giles from El Paso. She says, thanks Paul for the super summary of state-of-the-art diagenetic uh, diagenesis. I'm curious how important you think the flux of dissolved aragonite in sediments to seawater is. Could this be a source of whitings? Um, well, the, yes, well, I think many um, out there will know that the whitings issue, uh, which Sam Perkis has been involved in in the last few years, is an interesting one because uh, although in the Bahamas, whitings seem to have a probable physiochemical connection, um, uh, the, the type of carbonate mud being generated is very different from the rest of the carbonate meds that we see in, in, in tropical carbonates, as Gisler and co-workers have shown. Um, I don't know if there's any direct link, but I would suggest that if you take a conservative estimate of the input of skeletal aragonite in many shallow water, low energy carbonate systems, and how much of that you ne need to keep to, to produce MMAs and lots of us, when you make these models, these little numerical models, you of course make enormous number of little assumptions as you do it. So there's so much movement in these values. But I think a conservative estimate is that you only need to trap a few percent of the available aragonite to produce MMAs. Now, Axel, for example, makes a strong case that this type of diagenesis is a closed system. Whereas the evidence that it's, it, it's, it's um, an open system, maybe what has been produced by Higgins and co-workers from the use of these uh, calcium isotopes, I don't know. I think this is, again, budgets uh, are a big issue. I, I can't answer that question but directly, but um, I think we do need to go back to, uh, I do remember what Lynn Walter said back in the late 80s, and that is that I think the figure she quoted was 50% of the aragonite being deposited in the Bahamas is being lost early. A figure that shocked me. And I, I thought, well, the Bahamas is where carbonate accumulates, not dissolves. But of course, then I spent some years looking at the, the taponomic evidence for this. So I can't answer the question directly, but I think there's an urgent need now to start investigating um, what that flux is. Absolutely. All right, we'll get to our next question from Mohammed, um, coming from Michigan. Thank you for the great presentation and for providing evidence that diagenesis is cool. <laughs> My question is about aragonite loss during early diagenesis. What role does fluid chemistry play in inhibiting calcite precipitation following the aragonite dissolution in marine environments? For example, magnesium. Um, uh, yes, yeah, yeah. Um, I completely agree because we're told repeatedly of red that magnesium will, in, will have an effect. 
and um, I fully appreciate that. I did think of slipping that into one of my slides as a sort of you know proviso, but I can't answer that question. But I would turn if I can. So I'm not. I can't answer it. I'm sorry. But can I just turn it round slightly and say that HMC is arguably less stable in these pore waters than aragonite, and therefore HMC inversion to LMC is also likely to be taking place very very early, and. Despite m many efforts, I have found no evidence that HMC is inverting very early during shallow burial. For example, I'm not in my LMAs, um, I'm not seeing echinoderm fragments developing um, low magnesium calcite syntaxial, epitaxial overgrowth, whatever, very early. In fact, one of the problems I have with LMAs is that I don't see a lot of I'm high my calcite material preserved either. Um, I'm not suggesting that high my calcite dissolves in the way aragonite does, but this whole business of the magnesium calcite, magnesium bearing minerals in the muds and what role that magnesium plays is something I don't understand. Another thing is that if the magnesium is going very early, if, if, the, if the magnesium has been released very early, then is it acting to seed a lot of early dolomite? Uh, Phil Chiquette has talked about in, some years ago the importance of seed dolomites in um, matrix-rich carbonates. And I just wonder whether or not with that magnesium, whether it's, and if it's inhibiting calcite precipitation, may indeed be producing dolomite that we're not seeing readily. I don't know. These, mm -hmm. these are all things that geochemists need to tackle. I'm just the outcrop guy who's pointing out some of these problems. I think you're a little bit more than that, but um, yes, I do agree. Um, it, I think additionally, maybe the, the question of closed or open system or how much of that magnesium is actually getting you know, flushed out of the system or staying put, that might play a really large role in terms of um, how those elemental ratios would affect you know, or inhibit the precipitation of, of any mineral. But, um, okay, so our next question comes from um, Vincent Bonneau. He says, hi, Paul, thanks for the great talk, as usual. Do you think um, uranium lead dating may be applied to the LMAs and diagenetic bedding to demonstrate early aspects of the indurations or the fine nature of affected limestone is a limitation? I don't know. Um... I've, the, 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 I, I apologize for not remembering the names of all the authors, but there was a talk at the Prague IAF using uranium series dating to identify, uh, to, to, to put some real times on a, on a diagenetic sequence that I thought was one of the most interesting talks I've seen in years. And I just thought, well, I wish I knew more about uranium series dating and uh, dating individual di diagenetic phases. And then, um, one of my co-authors from some years ago on a paper on Triassic calcretes told me that he'd just been dating Trias the Triassic calcretes we'd worked on. And I said, oh, you mean the Anisian ones? And he said, yes, and get, guess what age they are? And this is fine grain carbonate in a calcrete. I said, what age are they? He said, Anisian. So I said, we could start dating calcretes then using that technique. But of course, actually, this has been done before some years ago. Um, so in fact, more than some years ago. So I think this whole idea of being able to, to date dry genetic phases is, is amazing. I must, a word of warning, every few years, a new technique comes along, which is going to be the panacea. It's going to just solve all our problems. Sure. And then very quickly, um, we begin to realize a bit like comes isotopes. Well, maybe it's not as straightforward as we thought. This always happens. I remember being told about the use of fluid inclusions by a metamorphic pathologist 40 years ago. And I said, oh, this is fantastic. And he said, yeah, but you wait. We've been doing that for years and it's not as straightforward as you think. But I think this will open, dating will open new opportunities. And it would be fantastic if it could help us to understand LMA. What I haven't told you is if you look at some LMAs in the Jurassic of South Wales, the core of the nodule and the center of the bed 
has a very good marine isotopic signal. So they started to form in shallow marine core waters. But the outer parts of the nodules and the outer parts of the bed have very clearly a late diagenetic deeper burial signal. Nasser Azani beautifully showed this in one of the papers I've, I've given the reference for in the slides. So you have to be careful. Again, you, you, you can't do, you know, you can't drop in and just dissolve a lump. You need to analyze the history of that diagenetic nodule first. And certainly many of these diagenetic beds and nodules, the LMAs, have had a, 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 a duplex history. They've had an early history and a later history where presumably the carbonate's been supplied by from pressure solution effects, for example, because you've got all those shales around them. So tread carefully, but I would hope that that dating technique is going to be a, something of a revolution, not just for LMAs, but for all sorts of other diagenesis and for dating calcreeds, for example, as well. And when you were talking about the nodule having a marine signature, you're meaning um, uh, an oxygen isotope signature? Yes, yeah, so very clearly a, 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 a marine signal. I mean, this is as actually shown in many papers, the, the norm, but sometimes the um, outer parts of the nodule have had a different history. And in fact, this is one thing I was going to touch upon, but I didn't have the time. Um, people tend to see diagenesis as very linear. And if you look at the history of some diagenetic nodules, yes, they started off forming early, and some of them have just gone into the burial realm and picked up a bit more carbonate. But others of these nodules have gone back up. They've gone into, they've actually been exhumed and they've gone back down again. There was a classic study uh, done by Richard Bennett some years ago, which was unpublished, looking at the history of ammonites in the Jurassic of Southern England. And he demonstrated that these ammonites were being buried below into the Taz, below the Taz, they were popping back up, and they had a very elaborate history. So linearity, if you like, in diagenesis is not always the case, especially during early diagenesis. And these nodules can have undergone quite complex histories. So dating them has to be done with care. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's move on to our next question. We have one from Noor from Hungary. Thank you for the fruitful presentation. My question is about how important um, the study of cyclicity is in recent carbonates. Oh, right. If you're talking about the fact that the, um, the awareness of LMAs has had a big, big impact on how we understand cyclicity, because um, in many of these um, offshore well-bedded sequences, people of course did run various analyses and picked up um, orbital forcing cycles and it's been very successful to do that in the chalk for example and extensive work has been done by people like Graham Whedon and Steve Hesselbo and Hugh Jenkins on Jurassic sequences. We're picking up orbital forcing and psych cyclostratigraphic controls but we also know that many of these diagenetic limestones are that, they're diagenetic and there are studies done for example, by Hildegard Westphal and others, which have shown that, in fact, you, you should avoid sequences which have diagenetic limestones in them when you try and do this. Um, so I think the jury is still out uh, on, on that. Of course, I have not, I've avoided the key issue is if aragonite dissolution is taking place all the time, why do you get bed? Why do you get shale limestone, shale limestone, so forth? Is it some type of self-organization that's going on? So ultimately, even though I think many of the cyclostratigraphers have now said, okay, many of the things we were measuring are diagenetic, but early diagenetic, we can, we, we can still fit that idea, that origin into a cyclostratigraphic model because the presence or absence of those limestones as against shales must be reflecting something which could be caused by orbital forces. So I think the jury is still out, but at least the cyclostratigraphers have now taken into account the role of diagenetic bedding in some of their studies um, and are still holding to the fact that they can pick out cyclostratigraphic patterns, even in diagenetically bedded succession. But mm -hmm. Hildegard Westphal is the person, I think, to, to offer a, an alternative or not. Okay. Alrighty, our next question is from Ross Campbell, coming from Queen's University in Canada. He wants to know if it's possible that the missing mollusk problem is more of a question of ecolo ecological variability and perhaps some relationship between the living environmental conditions and preservation potential. 
Um, let me. Ah, I, I, this uh, is what you're saying that as the before and afters, simply we've actually mistakenly chosen two different communities. Um, I think the, the, the argument that, let me give you one piece of evidence why we try to establish that that's not the case. When we've looked at these Lagerstaaten, we have not just compared the catastrophic with the, the, the non-catastrophic accumulation. We've also looked at statistical parameters within them. For example, when we find a life assemblage, we will also find the calcitic fossils in there that occur in the non-catastrophic, taphonomically skewed assemblage. So we've looked at the ratios of the calcitic fossils to one another, and the ratios in the of the calcitic components to each other are the same in the catastrophic, catastrophic one as in the non-catastrophic one, where you only get the calcitic fossils. So that's the best way that we can try and get an idea that the communities have the same components in them at the same ratios. It's just that one big component is missing normally. Um, also, um, you can compare the skeletal lagerstatin with the non-skeletal lagerstatin in single outcrop. You can literally go from one of these Pompeii events, if you like, where an ash fall has preserved the living assemblage. You can go, you know, a meter higher in the stratigraphy and see exactly the same lithology with exactly the same calcitic fossils in both, but completely missing the aragonitic fauna. So it's this comparison between composition and between stratigraphic relationships, which leads us to believe that these this catastrophic skewing has to be a result of early dissolution. It's exactly what Lynn Walter and co-workers were telling us back in the late 80s, early 90s, or what they suspected was going on. Alrighty, um, our next question is from Victoria, um, coming from Moldova. Thank you for the amazing presentation. A short question on boron proxy text testing. Some uh, isotope ratios are typically used to determine paleo pH of seawater. Could this method also be used to determine the um, accuracy of sulfuric acid somewhere in carbonate deposits? I know absolutely nothing about the use of boron. I'm sorry. Um, I couldn't answer that question. My geochemistry isn't good enough to answer that. Um, acidity, of course, you know, related to major events, to extinctions and things is important. And I'm not thought that maybe you could try and analyze that as well. Um, so it's an interesting idea, but I have to let the geochemist tackle that one, I'm sorry. All right. Um, so our next question comes from Patrick in Erlangen, Germany. Thank you very much, Paul, for your great talk. It's possible, or is it possible, that the magnesium for the dolomite may come from high magnesium calcite during dolomitization? Um, I'm not quite clear. Chelsea, could, could you repeat that one? Yes. Um, he wants to know if it's possible that the magnesium for the dolomite may come from high magnesium calcite during dolomitization. So I guess maybe he's, um, he's asking if the dissolution of yes. high mag calcite uh, may lead to the dolomitization in the system. Hopefully, uh, I got your question right. Well, yeah, yeah I, I think that, um, as I mentioned earlier, that magnesium, if it's being released as early as the, or even earlier than your agonized going, has to be going somewhere. Is it just going back flexed into the, into the ocean, or is it reacting and producing something? What I would say is that um, we have looked in LMA, the ones I've been involved in studies of, for microdolomites. And we've not found any. Um, now, that doesn't mean to say that they're not there and we haven't looked hard enough. I know that Axel has found microdolomites in some Silurian uh, examples where the microdolomites are trapped in the LMC grain. But I'm not aware, and I should be, if he has identified any um, secondary dolomites within LMAs. I have not seen any of that. If magnesium is being released very early when all this is going on, 
it's getting fleshed out. Mm -hmm. Okay, our next question is from Mumtaz, um, coming from Islamabad. It says, thank you, Paul, for your interesting presentation. As you talked about carbonate pipes and eosine carbonates offshore India, I would like to share about eosine carbonates in the Potwar sub-basin in Pakistan, where we have irregular dolomitization, maybe linked to upwelling fluids, um, really making complex reservoirs. Okay, so a little bit more of a comment. <laughs> um, yeah, thank you. It, for... it, it's strange that I have to make a case. I mean, I, when I talk about burial corrosion, particularly in, in industry meetings or something like this, I, I really have to make a strong case that this is an important process. And yet we've known that regional flow is, has been, is producing large dolomite bodies. We've known this for decades, mm -hmm. or producing minerals. So it's only part of that spectrum. So I think increasingly people are going to realize that a lot of, I mean, I've been absolutely shocked in the last few years at the number of papers and the number of talks I've seen where people are identifying seismic scale retro chimneys in the subsurface in the Middle East now. It's becoming almost a habit to do this in, in Middle Eastern reservoirs. So I think the more we look, the more we're going to find evidence of large scale dissolution fault related initially uh, in, in the subsurface. Whether it's, as I said, often linked to dolomite, but not always linked to dolomite. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, well, I think we finally got to all of our questions. Paul, thank you so much for the wonderful presentation. We really enjoyed having you on today. I surely um, really liked uh, everything that you brought to the table. So um, thank you everybody that's still in the audience for showing up. And make sure and come back next week. We're going to have our third SEDS Online student webinar titled New Insights into Coastal Processes from the Sedimentological Record. Um, so please come out and support these students. They work really hard on these presentations and are, can give us really some of the most uh, fresh insight to these topics. And we look forward to seeing you then. <laughs>